Hi, everybody. I'm Mary Beth Horsington on behalf of the Strathmore Speaker Series. Thanks so much for stopping in here tonight for our third event of the 2021 season. Under normal circumstances, we'd be holding this event at the Fire Barn in Onondaga Park in the Strathmore neighborhood, but COVID has necessitated the switch to Zoom. Fortunately, the Onondaga Free Library is providing the technical assistance we need to bring you this program, and we thank them for their expertise and generosity. The Strathmore Speaker Series is made possible through the support of the City of Syracuse, the Gifford Foundation, and the Greater Strathmore Neighborhood Association. Our guest speaker tonight is Samuel Gruber, President of the Arts and Crafts Society of Central New York. Dr. Gruber will take us on a Zoom tour of the Syracuse neighborhoods that feature the architecture of Ward Wellington Ward, the most accomplished architect of the arts and crafts movement of the early 1900s. Many of Ward's houses remain occupied and in excellent condition. Samuel Gruber is an accomplished researcher, author, curator, and consultant. He is an internationally recognized expert in the architecture and preservation of religious properties. He founded and serves as managing director of Gruber Heritage Lo Global, a cultural resources consulting firm. Previously, Dr. Gruber served as executive director of the Preservation Association of Central New York and many other nonprofit boards and committees. Dr. Gruber earned a master's degree and a PhD from Columbia University, bachelor, a bachelor's degree from Princeton University, and a certificate in surveying and measured drawing from Cornell University. When Dr. Gruber completes his talk, there will be a question and answer session, so stay tuned on your Zoom screen. And now, please welcome our speaker, Dr. Samuel Gruber. Unmute. Okay. Thank you. And I'm very glad to be here. Um, it's been a while since I've um, spoken to the Strathmore group. Uh, there were times back uh, when we had the house tours that I was speaking under a tent or uh, otherwise out in the open. And um, in part, uh, because I like to do that and I like to take people on walking tours, uh, I thought I would uh, adapt that approach to the um, Zoom environment, to the pandemic uh, situation. And in a sense, I've been doing that for the last, uh, oh, at least nine of the last 12 months, uh, because once it became clear in the uh, spring last year after March that the Arts and Crafts Society of Central New York was going to have to cancel its uh, in-person programming, especially the, uh, the walking tours. Uh, we had one scheduled, in fact, for Robin O Road. Um, I, I thought about ways that we can present material to a broad public um, without too much <laughs> effort. And um, I came up with the idea of focusing on the buildings of Ward Wellington Ward. And since I had to get out of the house and walk my dog, I began uh, going out regularly and uh, really just uh, walking neighborhoods and uh, finding ward houses, many of them which I had never really paid attention to in the past, uh, particularly those outside of my own neighborhood on the east side. And, um, and then I began posting about them on, on, um, on Facebook, on the Arts and Crafts Society uh, of Central New York Facebook. I'm going to share my screen now and see if we can do this. Oops, it's got the way up there to Um, and uh, the the title of those, the collective title of those uh, Facebook posts was W.W. W. Uh, Ward Wellington, that is W.W. W. Warding Off the Virus. And um, I tried uh, every day or a few times a week to put up pictures and some historical information and some architectural analysis of different houses around the city. I did have to take a break for a while and sometimes weather made it difficult, but uh, I think I've posted over 60, maybe close to 70 buildings so far. 
And uh, we still have a lot more to go because Ward Wellington Ward, um, I said he was the most accomplished arts and crafts architect in the city uh, because I was thinking of an architect who actually built buildings. I don't want to detract from Gustav Stickley and the importance that he had in creating an aesthetic and creating a whole movement of design. Uh, but Ward was accomplished and he was prolific. And in his career between about 1908 uh, and 1926, his career in upstate New York, uh, he built over 200 uh, projects and a lot of them survive. And about two thirds of those survive in the city of Syracuse. So I have not made my way through the entire uh, list yet. So I'll continue posting as we go through the, uh, the, the, the spring into the summer. Now, I'm no expert on Ward Wellington Ward. I'm getting to know a lot about Ward and because of my role with this Arts and Crafts Society of Central New York, I, I understand a lot of the issues, the background, um, both the social issues and the economic issues and the aesthetic issues that Ward was uh, confronting. Um, but I don't know the details of, of, of all, all of his buildings and nobody really does. Um, but if there's one person who we follow uh, in this, it's uh, my friend Cleota Reed. And going back to the 1970s, Cleota uh, really uh, brought uh, Ward to the public attention. And in 1978, she curated an important exhibition about Ward's work. She helped rediscover his magnificent drawings, which are now at the Onondaga Historical Association. And uh, she began to create a hand list of all of his uh, known, known buildings. Uh, there's this book from 1978 that I show you here the Ward House, which is the, the first stop that everyone should make if they want to know about Ward uh, and his role in Syracuse. Um, and after that work, uh, the really the Arts and Crafts Society of Central New York grew out of that project, um, but other, other events took place. And in 2002, there was a, uh, a commemorative weekend for Ward. Uh, a new gravestone was put uh, at, at the Moyer family plot. Um, and there were a lot of, a lot of events uh, celebrating his life and work. Uh, since that time though, there hasn't been much sustained work. Um, gradually, more and more of his buildings are being placed on the uh, National Register of Historic Places. Uh, back in 1996, the Preservation Association and the Arts and Crafts Society worked to create a Ward Wellington Ward multi-property uh, district. It's not really a district, but it's a multi-property designation uh, in which all of his works that are researched can collectively uh, be put on the National Register with a lot greater ease than if each, each building was being uh, submitted uh, uh, in isolation and the work was starting from scratch. Um, also during this time, Cleota has continually upgraded her list of buildings and the Arts and Crafts Society will be publishing very shortly a fourth edition, which you see a picture of here, of, of the hand list uh, that goes back several decades. And, and every edition has new buildings, some are taken off, um, a bit refinement of the dates and clients and, and more information is provided. Um, this is the Arts and Crafts Facebook page with the uh, warding off the virus, and you can follow that, and then that gets shared on different Facebook pages as well. Um, so, so I took um, I took Cleota's hand list, and and basically I just started walking the city and uh, highlight as I as I would see buildings, I would highlight them, and I would uh, uh, use her files, which which she has uh, uh, kindly um, put in my um, uh, control. Uh, they're actually right here in my office where I'm sitting right now and um, you know trying to see what we know about those buildings and what we still need to know. Uh, now while this has been happening I, I'm also delighted to report that the Onondaga Historical Association which houses uh, hundreds of wards drawings uh, has uh, received a, a, a very generous grant from uh, Russ King of the architects King and King 
uh, for preservation of OHA's architectural collections. And the first collection that they're going to uh, address is the Ward Wellington Ward Drawing Collection. And we're very excited that probably in the next year, we're going to see the digitization of, of the plans, sections, elevations of so many of his drawings. And I'll show you a few of them as we go forward. Um, and this is really important because uh, they're not so accessible right now. And um, even if they are accessible, they're so big and they're in packets usually of about eight drawings together that you can't compare them easily one building to another. And when we have the images all digitized, we're actually going to be able to look at the buildings, easily compare the drawings with the standing buildings, the extant buildings, but also compare the work uh, of one building and, and another. We can compare plans, we can compare details, and that's going to be very important to understand more about Ward's career. Ward didn't leave us very much information about himself except those drawings and except the buildings that still stand. Uh, we have a few photos that have been retrieved by uh, his family members. Uh, his grandson uh, was one of the instigators in that uh, weekend back in, in 2002. Um, and here you see Ward in 1900 with his wife Maud, uh, also from 1900, the year they were married. And it's that marriage that's so important because eventually that's what brings Moyer to Syracuse. He was born in Chicago um, and uh, in 1875. Uh, um, and then he was studied in Detroit, but eventually he went to MIT for architectural studies in the 1890s and ended up in uh, New York. Uh, where he practiced architecture till about 1908, when he and his bride, uh, Maud, who he met while she was studying at the Boston Conservatory of Music, uh, came to Syracuse because that was her hometown. And Maud came from a very prestigious and successful uh, family. Her father was Harvey Moyer, who had developed the Moyer Carriage Works, uh, which subsequently developed into an automobile company as well. And you know that the, the, the buildings are still extant up on uh, Bear Street uh, between Park and North Sina on, on the north side. Uh, this is what the complex looked like when, uh, when Ward came in 1908. And his very first building uh, was uh, to erect a new factory across Park Street uh, for the automobile production. And uh, you wouldn't have known this is what his capacity would be, or this is the direction he would take, given the one prior building of, of Ward that we can uh, identify. And that's a rather fantastic uh, villa house in Magnolia, Massachusetts. It was the H. G., Mrs. H.G. Curtis house known as Magnolia Manor uh, that was built in 1905. It's since destroyed, uh, but you can see it on this photograph on the left that it is a um, something of a, a historical pastiche, but a, a sort of a fantasy um, uh, a, a building with, with um, a lot of uh, half timbering and, and sort of bits and pieces of a kind of Romanesque architecture and then a, a central turret. Uh, this, this, um, this falls into the kind of genre of, of uh, fantasy and of folly architecture and, and luxury architecture. Uh, the, the biggest example was P.T. Barnum's uh, Isfahan uh, building that he, he had uh, that the architect Leopold Eidlitz had built earlier in the 19th century. Um, but these were, these were uh, favorite uh, uh, fantasies uh, for, for rich Americans uh, in the late 19th century, particularly during the Gilded Age. Uh, this is a rather late example in 1905. They were practical too, people lived in them. Um, so they had to function well. And uh, we don't know what the plan of this building was. We do know that later on, Ward would show himself a master planner of interior space. Um, so we hope that Mrs. Curtis enjoyed functional rooms as well as uh, 
sort of fantastical uh, decor. But you can see the contrast of these two buildings, um, nothing could be more, uh, more different. Um, but it's typical of the, of the versatility of most of the architects who were coming out of the architecture, the new architecture programs in the late 19th century. And MIT was a leading one, Columbia was a leading one, but Syracuse University had also uh, created its own architecture program uh, in the early 1890s. And a number of architects were graduating from the SU program and were also practicing in Syracuse in the early, uh, in the early part of 20th century. Here you see on the far right of this old postcard, the Moyer uh, automobile factory um, immortalized, you know, in, 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 a, in a, you know, I guess it's chromolithograph postcard. Um, and here you see that the building still stands today. And uh, this photo of uh, a Moyer car from 1911 uh, is parked in front of the door that's still there almost exactly as it was more than a hundred years ago. So Moyer moves uh, with Maud to Syracuse in, in 1908, and he immediately gets work with Maud's family, uh, and he builds that factory in 1909. And quickly, he's going to um, be introduced to the business and industrial elite in the city through his father-in-law. And so, you know, he's coming up against a, a very active architectural scene in, in Syracuse. Really, Syracuse had been on a building boom since the end of the Civil War. So throughout the 19th century, the city continued to grow by leaps and bounds and industry was booming. There was pressure for new industrial buildings, commercial buildings, office buildings, and of course, residential areas uh, to accommodate both the workers and the growing white collar middle class that was necessary to, uh, to manage uh, these, these, these companies. Uh, these are some of the leading architects from the previous generation. We can call them the mustachioed architects, I guess. Um, Archimedes Russell, who was the most prolific, Asamerik, who did a lot of public buildings, James Randall, who did public buildings and churches. Um, but there was also a, a more, um, uh, artistically inclined uh, group of architects who were working in Syracuse. Uh, foremost in the late 19th century was Joseph Lyman Silsby, who some of you may know did the uh, chapel in, in, in Oakwood Cemetery, and then he um, did the White Memorial Building downtown and the Syracuse Savings Bank. These late Victorian, very um, uh, uh, dramatic and detailed and somewhat somewhat uh, 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 frothy uh, uh, instructions, uh, a kind of what we call a Ruskinian Gothic, but it's using a very detailed and beautiful, beautiful carvings of floral uh, elements. Um, and in a sense, he's already bringing to Syracuse some early aspects of what we would call the English arts and crafts movement, which was very strong in the 1870s, 80s, 90s with people coming out of the tradition of, of Pugin and John Ruskin and especially William Morris. Um, Silsby goes on, moves on to Chicago where he becomes a leading architect and, and very influential on people like Frank Lloyd Wright and other, others. Um, so he's not here to compete with, uh, with the younger, the next generation. Um, Gustav Stickley comes to Syracuse as a furniture manufacturer, but by 1901, he's imagining complete architectural environments and he publishes his magazine, The Craftsman, which begins to promote architectural design as well as furniture design. And uh, though Stickley himself is not designing buildings, he's working with a lot of young designers who are designing buildings under his, his tutelage with his vision. And we know the names of some of these architects, but we still need to know more about them. Uh, Alfred Taylor, who also went to MIT and then would, would then go on to build more uh, public buildings and classical style buildings. Uh, Lamont Warner and others who left to go to Washington DC. But, but um, Ward comes after the first wave of these young designers who are working at the Craftsman from 1901 to about 1905 when Stickley moves to New York. Um, Another architect, Catherine Budd, uh, is a friend of the ceramicist Adelaide Alsop-Robineau, 
And she's brought in and designs a couple buildings, including Robineau's house and studio, Four Winds, is the name on Robineau Road. Uh, these are very influenced by English arts and crafts architect, architecture, but they are extremely important in the history of Syracuse architecture because they're very early examples of, of, of the arts, the full arts and crafts aesthetic. And the interiors of these houses tended to reflect some of Stickley's ideas, which were exactly contemporary. Um, but she actually creates full environments from the ground up. Whereas Stickley at that time, as you probably know, if you're following the restoration of the Gustav Stickley house on Columbus Avenue, Stickley was adapting a, a, a Queen Anne style house that he had bought. Um, and then after a fire was able to reconfigure it more to the, um, the tastes of, uh, of the arts and crafts movement, the craftsman movement as he called it, and, and his own particular vision. Uh, these are some of the younger architects that Ward was um, probably you know, coming up against when he got here in 1908. Uh, some of them came out of Syracuse's program. Uh, Tabor was actually the architect who built the house that Stickley bought. Um, and Congdon and Granger were both um, uh, young men uh, out of Syracuse, and they would um, they would cross paths with Ward. Uh, Congdon, especially uh, as an architect and as a developer, would would work with Ward in the Berkeley Park area and in Scott Home, in on the East Side. Um, so here's Ward um, in his prime. Uh, we, this is the photo that's usually used because we don't have a lot of personal documentation. His wife, Maud, destroyed uh, his papers, I believe, um, after his death. And uh, the drawings were saved, but we have no personal correspondence, no journals. And unlike a lot of architects at the time, uh, he, didn't, he doesn't seem to have written much or published anything uh, even though there were many architectural magazines and newsletters at the time that many architects were, were contributing to. Um, and frankly, he was building even, you know, by 1913, five years that he was into Syracuse, he was building more than a, a, a house a month. So, so he was, so, so he wouldn't have had time to do too much uh, writing on the side. So um, as Cleota says, he was a selective eclectic drawing on such diverse design sources as the English Arts and Crafts House, American vernacular styles from colonial New England to California Mission and the Prairie School of the Midwest. It's important to note that there is no real arts and crafts style. People often talk about an arts and crafts style. What they really mean is um, maybe the, the style of a particular uh, member or someone who followed the movement but the movement was more about principles rather than uh, particular architectural motifs. So you could have Spanish revival buildings, you could have bungalows, you could have Tudor Gothic, uh, all uh, falling within the, 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 the uh, bounds of what we would call the arts and crafts movement. It was more about um, the uniqueness uh, the hands-on quality of the uh, craft and the manufacture of the elements and the design. Uh, there was a, a, a drive for some humility in the architecture as a reaction to some of the grand opulence of the Gilded Age that had come before. Um, and there was also um, a desire to be close to nature. So many, many of the arts and crafts houses around the country are set in beautiful, uh, if not absolutely gorgeous, remote natural settings, at least gardens and, 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 and lawns. And you can see that by 1916, uh, so six, eight years after he came to Syracuse, he and Maud build a big place for themselves uh, up in Liverpool, that many of you probably know the remains of it, the last remains of it were torn down not long ago. Um, and he calls it Lemoyne Manor. And it's built across the road from Moyerdale, which is the big estate of his father-in-law, um, Harvey Moyer. Here you can see Maud standing in, in, in front of the house in the center. And there you can see that the house is sort of curved along a drive 
and it's very irregular in its profile. Uh, many of the elements that you see in, um, in Le Moyne Manor uh, will turn up in all sorts of other uh, ward buildings. Some he'd already perfected before 1916, others he would carry on from here. The big stone chimney, uh, the what we call a clipped gable here, um, where, where it kind of looks like a, 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 a brim is being pulled down over the eyes of the, the face of the building, this, this, this facade, a lot of half timbering, and the sense that there is not um, bilateral symmetry, but there is balance, and there's a sense of flow. Um, it, it's meant to be varied, but not confusing. Uh, and those are sort of basic principles that we'll find throughout Ward's, Ward's architecture. Um, Ward, it's clear that he built Le Moyne Manor in this kind of a Tudor style, the half timbering. It, it looks like a, a late medieval Elizabethan type of, of, of house in, um, and, 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 and therefore uh, that's probably his favorite style. And he'll build a lot of houses in that. But he's also very adept with using other styles, uh, popular vernacular styles from American colonial, especially <coughs> New England colonial, Dutch. But he, he, he plays around. And the arts and crafts movement is not tied to historicism. So it can draw on the past, particularly a past where it feels the, the, the buildings came from the people, came from uh, craft. Um, but it can mix and match. It, it, it's not trying to replicate anything from the past. So uh, Moyer is able to carry out a lot of his works uh, in association with two great uh, uh, crafts people, crafts uh, men um, and visionaries. One is Henry Chapman Mercer, who's a, he's a remarkable man, uh, uh, an expert in so many different fields, but he's also a pioneer in American art ceramics and creates the Moravian pottery uh, works in Doylestown. And if you've never been there, it's, it's, it's a marvelous place to, to visit. I, I was there not long ago for the first time in many years and it never, it doesn't cease to amaze. Um, and then Henry Keck, who was here in Syracuse and uh, he'd, he'd worked with Tiffany and learned the art of stained glass, but he created his own uh, studio, uh, Henry Keck stained glass studio. Uh, in Syracuse and uh, Mercer supplied uh, tiles for almost 200 uh, ward projects, especially for fireplaces, for hearths as they were called. And Keck provided uh, rather simple leaded windows, uh, but sometimes uh, also color. So between the three of them, we have, we have Ward as an exquisite draftsman and he created uh, these hundreds of of meticulous drawings, which are in ink with a, with, a, with a color wash. And in themselves, they are works of art. They're just exquisite to look at. And then we have Mercer who created these extraordinary tiles. This is one of the more extravagant ones at the, at the uh, Garrett house. And then uh, Keck who made windows. And this is uh, a window from the Heitziger house, uh, Hunziger house on Robino Road. Okay, so very quickly, it takes a while for Ward to find his feet. Uh, because he builds a factory when he first gets here, he gets a lot of other factory work. So he creates an auto showroom. Uh, he creates a bread factory, uh, both of which still stand uh, walking distance from my house on the east side, both of which were in the process of redevelopment projects when COVID hit. So I don't know what the status of those works are today. Um, and then he gets alteration works. So this is, a, this is a house just a block from where I live uh, on Concord Place, uh, 1908, the year he arrived. And he probably is responsible for some of the attractive detail uh, on the edges. Um, what he did on the inside, we just, we just don't know. Um, he does a lot of basic housing on this expanding streetcar suburb neighborhood because this, the, the, the streetcar now runs right down Euclid Avenue, we're by the university. And this double house, he builds the Simmons house. Probably Mrs. Simmons lived on one flat and rented the other uh, for, for income. Um, but he also creates a lot of these little 
uh, almost um, chalets or, or mountain type uh, retreats. Uh, this one's on Euclid. Um, these two are on Lancaster, just around the corner. There are about six or seven of these in all. And some of them were apparently built for Mrs. Hamilton White. And it's not clear whether uh, what was going on there. Uh, we do know from her descendant, Ham White V, that uh, apparently the Whites would buy, uh, would build houses uh, so that people who were displaced from their houses by fire would have places to live. It's possible these houses serve that function, or it's possible there was something else going on because at the time they were built, this area of the university was still somewhat remote. It was being developed and it was seen as a retreat from the city. So these are little houses. It's possible that they were weekend houses for, um, for business people and industrialists. His first big commission for a house is the Estabrook Theron House uh, of 1909, right on Comstock across from the women's building at Syracuse University. Um, and you can see this is a mix of a Dutch uh, gambrel roof. Uh, so it looks like a Dutch colonial building, but he adds a lot of half timbering. Uh, he has columns uh, in a more classical or colonial uh, way on, on the side. So it's a very um, unusual mix, but, but very recognizable and it seems to fit in uh, quite well. Um, he got this through the wards as well because Estabrook was the lawyer for his father-in-law, um, Harvey Moyer, and Estabrook was building this for his own in-laws. So it's sort of by extension, family by extension. And that's the way things, things developed for quite some time. A beautiful early house on the corner of Concord and Allen Street. Again, I just walked by it a few minutes ago when I was walking my dog. Uh, these are the ward houses that I first got to know when I moved here to Syracuse, is the Captain Tuck House uh, from 1910. And the Tuck House is a mix of colonial revival. You still see that Dutch gambrel roof, that's that uh, multi-partite roof instead of a straight gable. Uh, it has fan lights in the, uh, in, in, in the gable. Uh, and it, uh, but it flows beautifully on the inside. This was on the uh, Preservation Association house tour the very first year when they were doing this about 20 years ago. And uh, everyone just marveled at the, uh, at the spatial organization. Uh, a lot of buildings in the university neighborhood uh, were built by Ward and by his contemporaries like Justice uh, Moog Scrafford and Clarence Congdon. Um, and uh, some of them have fared better than others. This is the Kellogg House of 1912. And uh, you can see that clipped gable very, very clearly there. Um, it used to have more trim. It had parapets, it had lattice work. Uh, it was uh, a mix of shingle and and uh, clappered. Uh, now it has uh, some vinyl and, and some other things have been ruined, but more or less its, its shape uh, remains. Uh, it was celebrated uh, in the book, uh, Architecture Worth Saving for Onondaga County uh, back in the late 60s, I think, early 70s by Harley McKee, the great architectural critic. And that actually is what one of the things that got Cleota Reed and others uh, looking at Ward more closely. These are four houses on the east side, and you can see there are some basic similarities. Um, so in this early part of his career, uh, he's dealing with smaller projects, obviously uh, smaller budgets as well. And he has a few uh, plans that he develops with slight variations. So this is the Kellogg house we just saw. This is the Orlo Branch Blanchard house where Cleota Reed lives, actually on, Allen, on Westcott Street on the right. Uh, this is the Eamon um, Sanderson House in Scottholm, where actually Don Radke, who's the chairman of the Syracuse Landmarks Preservation Board, lives. And this is the uh, Morgan Dunn House, which was just restored a few years ago, two years ago. Um, and I'll get to that later. Uh, these houses have a kind of cottage-like feel, and they fit in with um, the speculative uh, work that's going on in the neighborhood as these lots are being sold uh, build off, uh, sold and then built up 
Uh, often a single developer will be building multi houses, uh, multiple houses. Um, the ward houses all seem to be unique though. Uh, one uh, owner, one builder, and uh, they work with the client. So this is the Kelly house. Uh, you can see it's a little bit up on a rise and we have a few interior shots. The, the detail is still quite nice. Um, uh, I was in it with the previous owner, but um, I, I think a lot of it is still preserved. Uh, this is the Murphy house uh, from 1912. We have drawings for this. And though it's obscured much of the year by vegetation, uh, most of its original features uh, survive. Now, a few of the elements that we can expect in ward houses are these porches, um, often with a particular type of rail and lattice work in between the, the, the piers or the columns. We get uh, different window sizes. So Ward really likes to mix up the window sizes. It's very costly for contemporary owners to maintain their windows. Uh, he uses shed dormers uh, to give um, a, a larger uh, a space, a larger ceiling in the second floor. So he takes what looks like a little bungalow or cottage and he can inflate that into a two-story house. He wasn't alone in this. Um, this was, this was uh, the norm at the time. He likes to use a lot of shingle, um, but eventually beginning about 1914, 15, he starts using hollow tile construction and the hollow tile is then covered with stucco. And that's probably what's going on on the side of this building in uh, 1912. Uh, he was promoting his work um, through advertising and we have one self-published uh, promotional booklet. And some of his houses are illustrated in this. And it's interesting, we can look at the people who are advertising in this promotional booklet, and some of them actually are patrons of his houses. So uh, the Collins Paint Company is Frank Collins, and Collins in his life has war designed two of the houses. Um, so we find, uh, this is the picture of, of this little uh, Roy Carpenter house, the, the McKee house on the left, and the Roy Carpenter house on the right, this little cottage, um, is, uh, but with a great chimney, is, uh, we don't have the date, but it's probably late teens, maybe 1920 at the latest for this booklet, and here it is today, still in quite good condition on the 300 block of Allen Street. The McKee house, which you see on the left, has not fared so well, um, this is the way it looked. I took this picture about 10 years ago on the left, but this is the picture of what it looked like last year. A new owner has kind of painted the whole, the whole house gray and black. It's a different, different, different aesthetic entirely. Um, most of the fabric of the building though seems to be intact, although a few things perhaps have been lost. This is the Orlo Blanchard house. And here you see uh, typical features it's a small house, uh, two stories, but you can see there's a room up in the roof because you have this sh uh, shed dormer, but a little pediment in the center, giving it a little bit of action, a little a drama there. Uh, the windows are all different sizes, even in this small house. And there's a bay in the front. Uh, this little space here uh, on the right, looks like an add-on, what it is is it's, it's a vestibule. So it's a way of creating a space for depressurizing before you go into the main hall uh, for a side entrance house. Many contemporary houses in throughout Syracuse, not just in the Westcott neighborhood, uh, don't have this kind of space. You just have steps, then you have a side entrance immediately into a hall. Uh, what this does is it allows the house itself to have a greater space inside and a nice even flow between the front and the rear of the house without having to traverse uh, that, that other space. Um, there's a simple porch and this was normal for the day. Everybody was building porches because there was no uh, air conditioning and you had you sat on the porch in the summer and you had cross ventilation, but it was also the neighborly thing to do. It's one of the things that still makes Syracuse great. Um, and here you find, uh, this is Cleota Reed sitting on the bench, this very uh, high back bench uh, with little windows behind it uh, going into that vestibule area. Um, and we find this on a number of his other houses as well. 
The Morgan Dunn House is similar. This is what it looked like about five years ago. On the left, it was covered with steel siding. Um, and then a new owner uh, had it listed on the National Register and got some tax credits to restore it. And uh, this is what it looks like today, very close to its original design. And um, we have the original drawings for this building. And here you can see the, the front, um, the way it's been uh, restored uh, quite accurately. And here we can see something of the plan. Um, the entrance is here at the top. You come into a hall, stairway, dining room uh, to the right, living room on the left. So this should really be flipped, I guess, so we understand it better. And then you might expect the fireplace in a living room to be dead on uh, axis for the, for the length of the room. But what Ward does, he creates a side space, what is called in the arts and crafts movement, an ingle nook. Um, it's like an alcove and the fireplace is set there. So you actually have to come in this way, turn and then turn again. So the actual assembly space in front of the fire is here in the back part of the living room. And then the front part is closer to the windows um, uh, uh, onto, the, onto the side. And here's the fireplace. It's, uh, this is when the building was, before it was restored, um, but you can see it was clean. So all the elements are still intact. Uh, there's a sort of colonial mantelpiece, which is the norm for Ward, but then he has these tiles. This is a very simple fireplace, but these are Moravian tiles from Mercer. And you can see they're inset around the fireplace. And then he's got beautiful tiles for the floor of the hearth. And then there were built-in cabinets around them. And this is, uh, this is the series that are called Byzantine tiles. And they're uh, designs that Mercer developed from looking at South Italian and, um, and uh, Byzantine decoration. We find them in several of, uh, of the fireplaces. And then upstairs, we have bedrooms, three bedrooms, dressing rooms. It's quite spacious, actually. Uh, similar little houses. Uh, this is um, in, uh, on Circle Road. And this is the first house that Ward builds in one of these new garden suburb developments that are just beginning about the time of World War I. Eventually, we'll have Berkeley Park, Scott Holmes, Sedgwick, and Strathmore around the city. Um, and all of these are marketed as for higher class of, uh, of, uh, of buyers. Uh, they, they, they want more individuality in the designs. Uh, they're, not, they're not all restrictive in who can live there, but they're restrictive in how much money has to be spent uh, to, to build, the, build the building. Uh, and uh, he goes in with Clarence Congdon, uh, who's an arts and crafts architect, uh, in developing, who's the developer of this, but Ward supplies a couple, couple houses and Congdon designs a few uh, himself. And these are among the very first ones built on Circle Road to promote the development. Uh, these are two houses on Dorset Road, just around the corner, also in Berkeley Park. The first one is pretty early from 1913. That's the one uh, on, the, uh, on the right here. Uh, with the columns and then the more uh, uh, sort of looks like a late medieval cottage on the right is a little bit later from 1920. But two lots side by side and Ward uh, designs both houses. And here you can see he's beginning to use uh, hollow tile with stucco as well. And when you think of the uh, Porter house, which we'll see at the very end uh, in about 15 minutes, I think, uh, on um, uh, Strathmore Drive uh, from 1920, uh, it's it's essentially a bigger a bigger version of this of this house. So so and this is this is drawing on colonial revival uh, or federal style buildings. Now by 1920, when when the Sherman House is built here, uh, there's a very playful uh, look to the design. He is reaching back to some of the early arts and crafts architects like, uh, like Voise from England, 
uh, to get this English cottage look. Uh, it's, it's a very tight design, it's a very small lot. Uh, he gives a very steep roof uh, so he can get that extra floor up above. Uh, he's got tiles inset in designs into the stucco and then um, this very dramatic chimney which rises right in the center of the house uh, raising like, 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 like uh, just, just lifting the entire building uh, which seems to wrap around it. Uh, uh, and then also in, in, uh, in Berkeley Park, uh, probably a, a little less interesting a building, a very straightforward uh, one. We don't have documentation on this building, but family tradition, I believe, uh, says that it was Ward. And, and most of the elements look like Ward. Um, but I want to show you this one because it, it, it's a clear example of by 1918, uh, houses are being built with garages. So one of the nice things about many of the ward houses in the city from the late teens through the 1920s is we get the house and the garage uh, designed together, uh, creating an ensemble. The city's moving in many directions. It's annexing uh, land and it's moving out on the east along Genesee, uh, East Genesee Street towards DeWitt. Um, and uh, Ward builds a number of houses, a number of styles along here from really about 1910 when he erects this bungalow uh, for Bradley Fuller uh, into the mid 20s when he's designing some big kind of Tudor, Tudor style houses. Uh, this is derived really from California bungalows, which are being published in the Craftsman magazine and in other places. We don't know whether Ward himself visited California to look at the work of architects like Green and Green, but this is definitely in that tradition. And the big stone chimneys that Ward starts adding to his houses are, are part of that tradition too. Now this is 10 years later, but it's essentially on the same lot. It's an adjacent lot. It's the same, same client. Uh, and so it's very similar style. We, the bungalow is staying here. Ward doesn't build too many bungalows. We begin finding them going up cheaply all around the city uh, in the, in the, by the mid-teens. Uh, but he builds these ones. And then we'll see some houses up on Oak Street that he designed as well, which are, are sort of in the bungalow tradition. This is an unusual house. Uh, it has that bungalow horizontality, the low spread, but it has these, this big, deep columnar porch with a pediment. <coughs> it's got nice details like this um, little uh, sloping roof coming off, creating create probably a bathroom in there. Uh, uh, this is the house of one of the Arts and Crafts Society board members. Barb Opar, who is the architecture librarian at Syracuse University, and she's been in it for many years. Um, and a lot of houses go up in this neighborhood. Uh, Frank Collins, this is the second house that he has from Ward. He had a small house over on Sumner in the university area, but I guess as his company grew or maybe his family grew, uh, he, he built a grander house on the corner of East Genesee and and Allen Street, which is still very beautifully preserved. Next to it is the Kelly House, uh, also known as the Kelly Viscotton because a dean from SU lived there. Um, and here, this is a little bit later, we're already into the 1920s. And the, um, this kind of a stockbroker tutor as it comes to be called because so many people in financial services tend to like, tended to like this type of building in the 1920s. Um, so this is built next door. The, the two houses are very close, so they almost make a, a complex. It's very picturesque when the trees are in bloom. Another one up uh, East Genesee from uh, 19, uh, 1923 is the, is the Hofer House, also big stone chimney and uh, um, asymmetrical and uh, half timbering. And you can see this is a photo from a few years ago. This picture was taken this year and it now has solar panels on the roof. Um, on the north side, uh, Ward starts building a few houses early on, 1911, 1912. 
Uh, this is one of his earliest, the uh, Edward Salmon House, which is quite beautiful. It's very simple, uh, really a rectangular block, but it's got this sloping wing off to one side. And you can see there was a, there were probably, it was probably a porch here uh, with, with columns. Uh, these eyebrow um, dormers uh, or uh, in, the, in the roof uh, give it a somewhat quizzical uh, look. Uh, they're not unknown. Many architects use them, but I think Ward uses them more than anybody in, in Syracuse. This insertion of tiles and brick for decoration, decorative shutters, uh, asymmetry. Uh, these are all uh, things that he does in all of his books, but in all of his buildings, but, sorry. That's my alarm giving me a, telling me I should hurry up. Um, but, um, you know, he also, you can see that he likes, he, he, he's moving, uh, he, he can work with a flat wall. He doesn't have to have shingles and clapboards. He can, he can do that smooth surface. All right, I'll go through. So these are other ones in the north side uh, in the area near Sedgwick. Uh, these are early ones from 15, the Ailing House. Uh, this is also the uh, home of a Arts and Crafts Society board member, um, Dana Spiota. And I hope we'll get to tour that at some point. Uh, the Tenney House from 1915, really a nice Tudor uh, design. And here you can see the way Keck windows are used for decoration just over the doorway, which you see here. Um, and then the leaded windows as the stair goes up. Um, the fireplace, the Keck, uh, the uh, Mercer fireplace with, with inserted tiles and uh, a fireplace on the second floor. Uh, probably the most interesting house of this period on the north side is the, is the Frank and Millie Garrett house uh, on Highland. Unfortunately, it's now in very poor condition. Uh, the neighborhood around it was all developed when the mansions were torn down on James Street. So unfortunately, nobody really wants to put a lot of money into the house to live there. It's close to Rose Hill Cemetery. So looking in one direction, it's rather pretty, but around it, not so much. Uh, it was very interesting because it's, it, it pulls on this medieval English tradition and has a kind of thatch-like roof. He uses a special type of wood material to give it this thick textured look, and you get it over the doorway here too. Uh, this was all replaced um, about 2012. The, the, an owner, uh, somebody I think who lives in Ithaca bought the building saying he was going to restore it did replace the roof, but not uh, historically accurate. But since then the building has sat empty and it's falling apart. We have beautiful documentation for the building. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, this was 2019, I took these pictures and it's really, it's really falling apart. And uh, the great fireplace, this is one of the best fireplaces that we know uh, that were designed with Mercer tiles of St. George slaying the dragon. Uh, part of this has been removed, has been probably stolen. Uh, it might be able to be replicated if someone really wanted to do it because the Moravian pottery works are still in business. Um, but it's hard to believe that anyone will, uh, would take that care. Here you can see a beautiful example of this ingle nook with the little benches by the fireplace and the built-ins. Um, that's all heavily damaged now. Uh, not far from uh, Highland on Oak Street, there's a little complex of three houses uh, flanking the entrance to Schiller Park, uh, the Ziegler family. Uh, Carl Ziegler apparently had uh, Wellington Tabor build the first house, which has long been attributed to Ward, but we know that it was Tabor now. And then he had uh, Ward designed houses for his two children, one on each side of the entrance to the park. And this is the... Uh, house that he designed for his daughter, who I think his name was Hilda, um, uh, and her husband Charles. So really we should be including the should be including the wife's name here because actually it was the wife's money that built the house, um, not, the, not the husband. Um, this is a lovely little cottage. It was on the market about two years ago when I took these pictures. The new owners are doing a great job in, um, in taking care of it. It needed a lot of work. All the original features are intact though, 
and they're working very hard to keep it uh, that way. So these were taken before the new owners moved in, um, but you can see uh, how it's a mix of the arts and crafts fireplace, but kind of um, a kind of colonial type of woodwork uh, with, with piers and, and capitals, uh, beautiful floors, uh, beautiful windows. Uh, we have the zodiac tiles here, and here are some of the examples. We have drawings for the um, Carl Ziegler house, which is the sun across the way. And look at that great chimney. This is definitely a, a bungalow style house. And uh, when it was finally built, the stonework isn't quite the same, but the, the impression is, 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 I think, similar to what Ward wanted. Um, the house is in pretty good condition. Uh, not too much has been changed. And here's some details of it. There's also a garage that was shared by the whole family, uh, which is behind. We're gonna skip the Pullman house. Um, Scott Holm is another area like Berkeley Park that Ward got involved in early because of Clarence Congdon probably. Congdon wasn't no longer working as an architect but only as a developer. So he was uh, acting as a developer, as an agent, uh, really, for the, for the owner of the whole uh, uh, complex. Ward designed the gates into the complex that you see here. And then he designed several houses, uh, on some on Scott Home Terrace, Scott Home Boulevard, and this one right on East Genesee uh, at the entrance. This is the, uh, the Leslie Appleby house. So this work went well into the 1920s. So we have about a 10 year span and a very wide range of, of types. So this is Earl, this is the first build, the, the earliest, I think 1916, um, we looked at that before. Uh, this one from 1919 looks like it could be in California, but actually if you imagined the siding being shingle instead of just whitewash, uh, the actual design of the house and most of its detailing is not too different from the house uh, two doors down, which is right here, Sanderson. And then Sanderson, who was one of the developers of the property, he built a second house, which is known as the electric house. And this was pretty much a demonstration house to show new utilities and appliances. Um, and it, you know, if we didn't know that it was Ward, I think we'd be very surprised. It almost looks like a French kind of Renaissance type of uh, building, although stripped down very simply um, in a more contemporary modernist way. Um, in Sedgwick, there are a number of houses. This is for the uh, brother, no, this is for the nephew of his wife, uh, Maud, for Edward Moyer. Uh, and it's a fairly simple uh, Tudor uh, house on a corner. Um, he built several uh, colonial revival houses on Rugby Road uh, in the early 20s. Uh, they were shingle style. They're now, this one's now covered with uh, vinyl, but very beautiful inside. And you can see uh, it's, it's very beautifully maintained. These are pictures from when it was last on the market. Um, there's this lovely little um, Gothic uh, building on James Street, a little house. Uh, and this is similar to what we'll find a little bit on the west side in Strathmore. Uh, and this is the rear where he mixes two, half timbering and, and sort of Gothic arches, uh, somewhat eclectic look. And then we have some colonial looking buildings up on James Street from the early 20s with garages. And then this big house, the Peters house, um, which is on a rise. So it looks really massive on James Street, um, very um, austere, uh, you know, in a classical uh, uh, colonial way. And this is almost contemporary also with the Peters house on Scott Home Drive. Okay, uh, we looked at, let's look, finish up and look at a few houses in Strathmore since this is the Strathmore Speakers uh, series. Uh, you all know these houses very well. Many of them, if not all of them have been on the house tours over the years. Um, but we'll just take a quite quick look at the variety. Uh, I think the earliest ones, like this one, uh, 
the Sanford House on Summit are are the are the are the liveliest, and they 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 use that kind of um, medieval mix, and they have uh, uneven uh, uh, roof lines, and and they have uh, asymmetrical uh, uh, facade arrangements, off-center chimneys. Uh, they have uh, really deep overhanging eaves. They're a little bit more romantic. And then we get buildings like this one, uh, still early 14, uh, the, the Dunphy House and the, uh, and the um, Fairchild House, both from 1914, which are really looking probably to the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright and Prairie School architects uh, of, that, of that period. Uh, these are hollow tile construction and uh, they may be, I know in the 20s he starts using steel beams. I don't know that, I don't think, don't know that he's doing that here yet. Um, but they, they emphasize horizont, horizontality. So if we see here, Sanford House, it's much more vertical. And, and now he's moving to these, these broader horizontal strokes. How much of that is Ward? We don't know how much of it is <clears throat> the request of the client, how much of it is the taste of the time, the flavor of the month, you know, what's being promoted in, in the magazines and journals that everyone is reading. And that's, those are things that still need to be researched. Um, the Stoll House from 1919 on Robineau Road, which is um, one of several word houses there on this Roberts extension, which, which gets built up about the same time as Strathmore, as you know, um, is a very unusual house and it's frequently illustrated, but it's, it's very atypical uh, in that it's stone. Um, it's actually, again, I think hollow tile with steel, but it has stone facing and um, it it's, draws on colonial revival or federal, federal style uh, architecture. Think of something like the Foreman house down on Seneca Turnpike down in the valley. Um, it has uh, beautiful uh, fireplaces and, and interior detailing, which you see uh, here, built-ins, a slightly curving stair, um, beautiful entry uh, foyer. Uh, and then uh, the first big house in Strathmore that goes up is the Porter House. This was Porter, uh, one of the Porters of Porter Cable. And I should say that a lot of the, oh, and Stowell House, this house, he was uh, in the auto industry, auto business. Um, they, they, they manufactured, uh, uh, I forget exactly what Stoll made, but whether they made full cars or parts for cars. Uh, a lot of the clients of um, Ward in this period are industrialists and he gets a lot of people out from the auto indus industry. And here you can see the house just going up and then um, the way it looks today, quite beautiful. Uh, the fan lights, the porch austere, but look at all the different window sizes. There must be seven or eight different window sizes in that, in that house. Uh, interior details, leaded windows, beautiful banister, um, and uh, fireplace and leaded windows here too. And then a few on Robino Road, about the same time he's mixing things up because the same year he's building a Tudor house here for Dr. Webb. Um, this is also uh, same time in a different neighborhood. We'll just skip that. And, uh, and then lastly, the, uh, the Hunziger house from 1926, which is on the corner of Robineau Road and Strathmore. Um, this is possibly the last house that, that Ward designs. He dies in, uh, he stops working in 26. He becomes ill um, and uh, he, uh, though, though the house next door uh, uh, around the corner at 208 uh, Strathmore Drive is uh, dated uh, 1929, the design was probably earlier. This has uh, all of the elements that we come to expect uh, in a ward house, very accomplished uh, in the design, but very restrained. And this is, uh, it, it's a Tudor house, but it almost has a kind of classical serenity to it. 
And the fireplace until recently was covered by uh, black marble put in in the 1960s, I think. And the current owners uh, removed that two years ago. I happened to be there when they pulled it off and you can see underneath it is a beautiful uh, Zodiac uh, Mercer tile of fireplace that you see there. And I'll just end with this shot of the two, two ward houses um, on Scott Holm, uh, sorry, on Strathmore Drive. Okay, so thank you very much for your uh, patience. I think we went probably a little long. I know my alarm went off a few minutes ago, <laughs> more than a few minutes ago, um, but thanks for sticking with it. And uh, we'll open it up for a Q&A. Um, and we'll let, uh, I think Scott's gonna moderate or I don't know who's moderating that. I'm gonna do the moderating. So yeah, so if you have any questions, uh, please put type them into the chat. Um, one of the questions we have is from Jenna McLaughlin. And, oh, no, I'm sorry, that's not from Jenna McLaughlin. I have to scroll up. Apologies, Jenna. Uh, it's from Simone Montgomery. Uh, are the houses on East Genesee Street and Salt Spring Street Ward Wellington houses? Yes, there are quite a lot. I showed a number of them. There are about 12 houses, um, starting with, um, well, actually, there's some that begin already around, uh, what is it, where Cambridge comes up in the East, uh, East Genesee, and then they pick up. So by the time you get to uh, the, the, where, where Salt Springs and Genesee split, uh, there are just a lot of, there are a lot of houses all along there. Uh, those, uh, those Bradley Fuller houses, those two bungalows are right there. And uh, the Appleby, uh, Appleton house is there and the gates to Scott Holmes. So that's a very rich area. And I have done walking tours there for the Arts and Crafts Society. So if, if uh, you know, we're allowed to do that again soon, we may do another, another walk in that area. And we've been in some of those, 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 those houses too. Okay, two questions. One, the first one is from Martha Ours. I'm a I apologize to everyone if I butcher your name in pronouncing it in the chat. Um, and she asks the exterior architect, she says the exterior architecture is marvelous and the interiors are amazing. And does the village of Liverpool have any ward houses? Um, she'd like to take a look if there are any in that neighborhood. Uh, well, you know, of course, Lemoyne Manor and Moyerdale were in Liverpool. Uh, I'm, not sh I'm not sure, I'd have to check the list. I know there are houses in many of the other uh, surrounding uh, municipalities. So in Solway and in um, all the way up to Baldwinsville. And there, there are a lot in, you know, we can go east to Oneida. In the 1920s, uh, Ward actually got uh, involved with a big development of an area, a very uh, high class area in, in Rochester and some of the suburbs in Rochester. And he did a lot of preliminary designs and there was a very uh, energetic and ambitious real estate salesman who took, took Ward's designs and actually uh, promoted them as he was selling the lots. And people bought these and commissioned Ward. So in the 1920s, a lot of Ward's work, best work is in Rochester, but it's biggest work, it's a big expensive buildings. And a lot of those still survive. Um, there are more than 25 of them, maybe maybe 35. And they're being researched now. Um, okay, Sue uh, says there are two houses in Liverpool Village and she should know, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I wanna give a shout out to Sue. Um, as I've been posting this stuff on, uh, on Facebook, she's been digging up a lot of biographical material on the, uh, on the owners. And it's really exciting because I think that's something we need to do is to understand this whole milieu. Who was actually supporting this, this type of building and who were supporting the arts and crafts artists. And there's a very, it's, it's interesting. The arts and crafts aesthetic talks, a, a, a good talk about, you know, humility and about simplicity and about handcraft um, but a lot of the patrons of the arts and crafts houses, a lot of wards patrons were actually industrialists and say were they were the people who were promoting 
industrial production of all sort of sorts of innovative things. And the design of these things, of course, is complex too. And the design of the machines that had to be created to make these also complex. So these were skilled craftsmen and, and, and machinists, but um, we often don't think of people who were designing gears and valves and things for automobiles as being you know, very involved also in promoting an arts and crafts aesthetic. And that's something I hope that we can explore a lot more going forward. Uh, uh, piggybacking on that, uh, Rhonda Williamson asks, you mentioned that the drawings are being archived. Uh, where, where is that and is, are, will those be available to, for public viewing? Yeah, the drawings are already well archived uh, at OHA. They've been there for uh, several decades, uh, but, they're, but they were being, but they're not easy to, uh, to get to and they're not easy to call. But you can go to OHA now and request to see a particular drawing or a particular house. They have the whole catalog there. But now they will be digitized so that you can, uh, I, I hope, I don't know what all the plans are. Are We're talking, the Arts and Crafts Society is talking with Bob Searing, the curator of history there, and with others, uh, you know, how this should be made public. But it would be great if there was a website where you could actually look at these uh, online. And uh, you still might have to pay money to get good size, you know, prints and reproductions, but for research purposes, you could look at the drawings uh, from your own home and you could compare things. And we'll know more in the coming, coming year as OHA uh, makes that known, but, but, um, but you can, OHA is open and the research center is open, although only a limited number of people are allowed at one time, so you can make an appointment, but you can go and look at the ward drawings at any, any, any time, uh, but just, you have to, you have to let them know in advance because they have to bring them out of storage. We have a question from Facebook from Meg Welch. And she says, you mentioned that uh, Welling, uh, Ward stopped working in 1926. What year did he die? And were any of his buildings that maybe weren't complete or were only just in blueprints completed, uh, built posthumously? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I think he dies in, I don't know, say 29 or 31. He's ill for several years. I should know that, but I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on it. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just check right now. But as far as unbuilt uh, projects, there are lots of drawings for projects that are, were never built or were not built where they say they're going to be built. So this is something that is hard to research. Um, there'll be a drawing say for a particular client at a particular address. We'll go to that address and that building is not there and it was never built there. But it could be that the client didn't like it so it wasn't built. It could be that the client bought a lot somewhere else and decided to build there. Or it could be that um, the client just found another, you, you know, didn't have the money or something. Um, there are lots of reasons. Uh, sometimes we have drawings and it just has the name of the street. So Cleota, and now I've been doing the same thing, you know, we look at those streets. It's easier now to, to start by doing uh, Google streetscapes. You can begin looking and say, is there anything on the street that remotely looks like a ward house? Uh, I've got to tell you, there are some ward houses at some addresses in the list that I've looked at that unless I had the proof that there's a building document that says War World War was the architect. <clears throat> Certainly from the outside, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. I mean, everything I showed you in this presentation is, you know, even the simple colonial revival ones are, are, are really nice buildings. They're, they're pretty distinctive, um, but there are a few of those ones up on Rugby Road on the 100 block of Rugby Road, the one at uh, 1800s James Street. Um, I mean, they, from the outside, they could have been built by one of any of a dozen different architects. Uh, I'm, a, I'm hoping that we'll be able to get uh, inside more of these and, and, and see if there's you know, what's left and, and if they're, if they're uh, distinctive qualities, but it would be great to be able to do that with the drawings. Cleota did some of that in the 70s and the Arts and Crafts Society is going to be scanning all of her slides taken three or four decades ago. So there may be views that we don't have, but we had hoped in 2020 to begin a big photography project in which we'd be writing to all the owners and asking if we could actually come and photograph the, 
the insides of the house. And that, that obviously couldn't happen with COVID. So that also was one of the things that got me just walking around and taking photographs of, of the, of the um, outside. Of the photos that I showed you, I guess 90% of them have been, were taken during COVID. Mm. Okay, so uh, of the exteriors, uh, but not all, not all. Okay, next question is from Buffy Quinn. And the question is, is there a comprehensive map showing the locations uh, or, or and she's actually offering, she's saying that if there is not, she'd be willing to make that map with GIS if it doesn't exist. Uh, I would love to work with you, Buffy. Um, there is a map that the city did a number of years ago, and there's a brochure that uh, may be out of print, but you can still pick it up. I think you can still pick it up a few places at OHA and maybe at, at down at City Hall uh, of a, a Ward Wellington Ward tours. It doesn't list all the buildings, but it's a kind of a generic map of the city and it has a lot of places listed. Um, and that's useful. And I actually, I meant to photograph it to scan it and put it up as, as, a, as a starting slide. Um, but what I would love to do is to work with Cleota's list and someone who's good with GIS, uh, and that could be you, Buffy, and uh, do some mapping where we can do it by neighborhood. We can map uh, color code to show the extant buildings, the buildings that have been torn down, because a lot have been torn down. And uh, we could also do it by decade. We could do it by style. There, there are lots of different ways. And I think that would be a great uh, presentation. And uh, that would, could, be, could be online, it could be at OHA, it could be a lot of different places. I mean, some of us have a dream that we would love to do a real book about Ward. Um, Cleota did the Ward House and she did the hand list. She went on and did very good books about Henry Chapman Mercer and the tile works and about Henry Keck and the stained glass studios, but she never got around, she never really did the book about Ward. And uh, Cleota is still very active and with us, she's in her eighties, but she said, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna do that book. You, you guys have to do it. Um, and I think we have a lot more resources and we ask a lot of different questions now. So Cleota could work with us, but we could actually do, uh, it would be great to do, move toward a kind of catalog raisonne where you had photos, drawings, description, but also there would be a way to do some broader analysis of both style, but also economics, patronage, things like that. Um, we have time for two more questions. Uh, the first one is from Robin Thompson and she asks, can you tell us anything about the Wellington House in Fayetteville? Yes, um, I didn't include it because I was just doing uh, buildings within the city of Syracuse. Uh, the Wellington House, of course, was the Estabrook estate. And I mentioned Estabrook was the heir of the uh, Moyer family. And um, that building really, uh, at the same time, the Arts and Crafts Society was founded and the exhibition in 1978 came to be. Uh, Tom Thomas bought the, 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 the Estabrook estate and created the Wellington House there as an as a events venue. And then, um, you know, last year, or was it two years ago, it just was no longer possible for him to run that. And he, you know, was closing that. And there was a real fear. There was talk of that being sold and developed, that area developed. Uh, and uh, are we still on? Yep. Yeah, okay. I'm just seeing a black slide here for some reason. Um, um, the... Uh, Oh, there we are. And um, fortunately, um, there was a big outcry uh, from the, the Arts and Crafts Society. We did a number of events and we did a lot of political um, lobbying, but everybody came out against losing this building and having yet another little shopping area there. And Ryan McMahon, uh, very forcefully, the county exec forcefully, he had a press conference like right there and said, no, we're not gonna lose this. And I said, wow, that's I was really, impressed that you put yourself on the line like that. And um, the Thomas family uh, 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 were, went back to the drawing table and they found uh, someone who essentially was an angel who bought the property and um, is very uh, excited about the property and you know is, is, is 
repairing it. And, and as far as I know, I haven't talked to him since during actually over this year. So the last I talked to him was in the spring. There was plans, you know, to, to make it a residence and possibly in the long term have some kind of bed and breakfast there. But the building is 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 saved and it's um, will be resource. We hope at the Preservation Association, I mean, at the uh, Arts and Crafts Society of Central New York, that it will uh, be a, uh, a, in some way a publicly accessible uh, amenity because we, we're looking at the uh, completion of the restoration of the Gustav Stickley House by the Gustav Stickley House Foundation within, we hope, two years. Uh, we have a lot of other great resources in the arts and crafts movement in Syracuse and Onondaga County and then going to Utica, going to uh, Roy Crofters in the, in, the, in the West, going to um, South to Ithaca. This is a really important uh, region and we need to promote it more and we, but to promote it more, we need to uh, collate all of our information, create maps as was suggested, create uh, uh, hand lists, brochures, promotional material and also have the venues accessible. If people can't see the places, then there's no, no point. So, so this is something that the Arts and Crafts Society and many of our partner organizations, the Stickley Museum in Fayetteville, the Everson Museum, which has you know, the Robineau collection in great ceramics, OHA, which has the Keck collection, Syracuse China collection, the Wardwell. We're all talking about this. It's something we're all, we all really want to see happen. And, um, you know, so, so, uh, but we need help. So anyone who wants to work on these projects, uh, there are lots of, lots of areas besides mapping, drawing up inventories, um, just doing photography, uh, newspaper research. There are lots of things that can be done, uh, much of it from, from your home computer now. So I, I, I urge you to participate. Uh, if you want to contact me or anyone uh, who's connected with any of this, just send an email to artscraftscny at gmail.com or go to the Arts and Crafts Society Central New York Facebook page and, uh, and you, can, you can send a message and we'll get back to you. Uh, you know, that, that would be, be great. Great, so the, the question that I was burning, dying to ask was whether or not the architects with all the fantastic mustaches ever got into a Jets versus Shark style, uh, you know, musical fight with the non-mustachioed architects. But I'm going to use the last question to ask uh, Patricia Black's question, who is one of the Strathmore speakers, um, board members. And she wants to know, what is your favorite Ward Wellington Ward House? Ooh, um, well, you know, I, I have to say I'm I'm very partial to those little houses on Oak Street, um, but but um, uh, I'm talking just about the Syracuse houses because I haven't I haven't really looked at closely at the Rochester houses and other ones. Um, I but I also love the the that um, uh, big house uh, on the corner of Scott Home uh, Scott Home. Boulevard and, and East Genesee, uh, when you can see it, when it's not all obscured. I don't know what it's like. I've never been inside it, actually. I became president of the Arts and Crafts Society a couple years ago. And I, though I did study with two really great people when I was in college, that was a long time ago. And I, I was very intensely interested in the English arts and crafts movement and, and you know, had, was a vociferous reader of Ruskin and Morris and all those people. Um, when I moved here in the early 90s to Syracuse, I knew all of this history was here, but I had other things that I had to do. It wasn't my, wasn't my focus. And I got quickly sucked into the Preservation Association of Central New York, and we had a lot of emergencies to deal with. Uh, and, and I was looking at a lot of other local architecture and local history. Uh, but when David Rudd, who was the longtime president of the Arts and Crafts Society and who runs Dalton's American Decorative Arts Store, you know, which is like a museum in itself up on James Street, uh, when David moved over to, take o to, to, to be head of the Gustav Stickley House Foundation and asked whether I would be president of the Arts and Crafts Society, 
I said, well, you know, I would love, I'm happy to, but I, you know, it's going to be a learning curve, uh, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm excited. So, uh, you know, so I've learned a lot. I know a lot, but there's so much I don't know. And everybody I meet um, tells me something different. I learned something new, either about the history, about the buildings, about the people who live there. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a fun thing to do. I, I, I've actually, it's been great for me during COVID. It's, it stopped me from going crazy, I think, this last year. Uh, and and that, that's been great. But I've, I'm sorry that we haven't been able to do events to share, share. But, but I like doing this and maybe we'll do some more things on Zoom. But I'm hoping that maybe by late April, May, uh, when more people are vaccinated and we can do it with masks and a, and a, and a, a microphone and speaker, which we always use, that I'll be able to start doing walking tours again and we'll be able to get some people out uh, walking in neighborhoods. But meanwhile, that's something you can do yourself. I just take my dog, I, get I got tired walking in my own neighborhood, I just took my dog in the car and every nice day we just go to a different neighborhood in the city and we just walk around for an hour or two and everybody can do that, anyone can do that. And now we'll start going out to all the towns and villages nearby, so that'll be good too. Fantastic. Yeah, well, we're looking forward to it. All right. Well, I'm going to say thank you to Dr. Gruber, and I'm going to throw it back to Mary Beth, who's going to tell you about some of our upcoming events. Oh, and can I, can I say something? If there are questions in the chat that I didn't get to, or if you have other questions, you can also send them to me, um, artscraftscny at gmail. You can also do it samuelgruber at gmail.com, but I may not get to it as quickly that way. Um, but I, I, I do like to engage if we if I can do that. Great. Awesome. All right, Mary Beth, over to you. Great. I'm noticing that a couple peop people posted that Ward died in 1932, which means he was 32. in his 50s. So it's amazing what he accomplished in such a short life, really. Thank you so much, Dr. Gruber, for joining us here tonight. And thank you for sharing your knowledge of ward architecture in central New York. Keep in mind that our programs are always on the second Thursday of the month. And our next speaker will be on April 8th. Please join us for guest speaker, Eddie Brennan, the president of Beacon Skiff. He'll share the story of how his family business started as an apple farm and evolved into alcohol production and ultimately uh, ultimately, it's become a well-known tourist and event de destination. You can find updates on the series at our website, strathmorespeakers.com. And thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. We hope to see you again in April. Night. <laughs>